Good afternoon, all, and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Council on Foundations in partnership with the Military Family Research Institute at Purdue University. My name is Tim Huber, and I'm the Research and Policy Associate at the Council. Before we jump into today's exciting program, and I turn it over to Dr. Shelley McDermott Wadsworth to get us started, let me run through a few quick housekeeping items that will help this webinar to go smoothly. If you are having problems with your connection, you can select the Help option in the toolbar at the top of your GoToWebinar navigational panel. The lines will remain muted for the entire webinar to ensure a clear connection. If you have a question for the presenters, we encourage you to submit it by clicking the Q&A icon in the toolbar on the right side of your screen and typing it in. We'll get to as many questions as we are able to in the time allotted. If we can't get to your question, we will follow up with you individually after the webinar has concluded. Today's webinar will be recorded, and both the recording and the slides will be available on our website shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. I'd also like to take the opportunity to promo another important webinar on veterans coming up on April 7th. We invite you to join the National Association of Veteran Serving Organizations, NAVSO, as they host a panel discussion offering service provider insights into solving veteran homelessness. The webinar, entitled Perspectives on Sol Solving Veteran Homelessness, will take place on April 7th at 2 p.m., and you can register at navso.org. The first 75 Council and Veterans Exchange members will get a free registration. Speaking of the Veterans Exchange, if you are a funder, we do invite you to consider joining this important online tool. Simply send an email to membership at cof.org. Now it's my pleasure to hand this over to Dr. Shelley McDermott Wadsworth, Dr. McDermott Wadsworth is a professor and the director of the Military and Family Research Institute at Purdue University. She has been studying and conducting research about and for military families since 2000, and we are delighted to be able to partner with Purdue and present this discussion to the field. Dr. McDermott Wadsworth. Thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome, and thank you to everyone who has um, joined the call today. We also are honored to have this opportunity to bring some great scholars together to speak about uh, their work and about the larger issue of access to care for military members, veterans, and their families. Um, just a couple of words about MFRI before we begin. Um, MFRI is a research and outreach organization. We're part of Purdue University, but we are an institute that uh, relies on gift grants, contracts, and other um, vehicles to support our work. Um, as was said earlier, we were created um, in, 2000, in 1999 and stood up in 2000 and have been working ever since um, to make a difference for families who serve. Today, we spend our days developing and testing research-based innovations aimed at filling gaps and strengthening efforts in the military and veteran space, both on our own and in partnership with others. Um, on the research side, uh, for example, one of our recently completed studies focuses on uh, the intergenerational impact of war on young children. Um, and in the more community-based side, um, perhaps our largest and best-known effort is called Star Behavioral Health Providers, and it's aimed at uh, training community-based behavioral health providers in seven states so far um, to be better prepared to serve military and veteran families. Uh, we operate uh, around the country in partnership with universities, with the National Guard in each state, and with other organizations. Another effort just now coming online is called Measuring Communities. Uh, it's an indicator effort uh, focused very much on place with a goal of trying to bring uh, research and evidence and scholarly perspectives to um, much of the community mobilization work that's going on around the country. If any of you have interests in learning more about these efforts, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, I'm very pleased to report that we're celebrating a birthday this year, the 15th anniversary of MFRI, as well as the 20th anniversary of its parent organization, the Center for Families at Purdue. We'll be holding a birthday party on April 25th in Indianapolis, and if anyone would like to attend, you'd be more than welcome. Um, also, you can feel free to follow us on social media, as indicated on the slide here. Um, let me now turn my attention to um, the first presentation for today. Dr. Charles Hogue was unable to be with us today, but he gave me permission 
um, to impersonate him on a webinar. Uh, he spoke when we gave uh, these presentations uh, on Capitol Hill in partnership with uh, Senator Donnelly and um, Representative Walorski. Um, and we're reprising it today, but Dr. Hogue was unable to join us. He is a retired Army colonel whose specialties are internal medicine, infectious diseases, and psychiatry. He's a neuropsychiatry consultant at the Office of the Army Surgeon General and attending psychiatrist at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Um, and the first slide set is up. And um, so I can tell you that um, Dr. Hogue has been a leader in many things, but one of the things that he and his colleagues have focused on is the notion of stigma. We all hear lots of conversation about stigma, that we have to get rid of stigma, that stigma is what um, prevents service members and veterans and their families from uh, seeking care, as well as many civilians. And Dr. Hogue has completed a line of research that um, starts to unpack the issue of stigma. So the slide that you see uh, comes from research that he published uh, a few years ago that tries to get into the inner workings um, of stigma. And there are two things that are important about this slide. One is that there are aspects of stigma that have to do with how people think about themselves and then how they think about the reactions of others. And this point will be elaborated on a little bit more later, but it's very important. The second point that's important about this slide is the difference between the dark blue bars and the light blue bars. The dark blue bars reflect the degree to which that particular belief is held by people who screened positive for a mental health problem as opposed to people who did not screen positive. Screening doesn't mean that they have a diagnosis. It just means that um, their symptoms merit further attention, and what you can see is that the people who screen positive are much more likely to perceive stigma um, as others. And that creates a challenge for um, all of us, as well as for the person who's experiencing um, the symptoms. So, so here we have stigma. On the next slide, you will see a focus on barriers. And Barriers to care are different from stigma because they are external factors or perceived external factors that actually make it difficult for people to seek care. Once again, you see that folks who screen positive, the dark blue bars, are more likely to perceive these barriers or report perceiving these barriers than people who did not screen positive. And so here we have another um, set of impediments that might be important for um, explaining why so few people um, promptly receive, seek and receive um, care for mental health symptoms. The next slide, however, um, shows some good news. And that is that um, over the course of the recent conflicts, um, there has been some change that um, given all of the efforts made to raise the visibility and the awareness about mental health issues, um, efforts to try to combat stigma, you can see that um, the data are showing, at least among service members, um, that there has been a decline in the figure on the left from about slightly under 40% to about 35%, and then um, on the right um, from just over 50% and that line bounces around a little bit more. So in general, um, uh, declines uh, in perceived stigma. The next slide shows that uh, there appears to be a companion set of, of trends about the utilization of mental health services. So in contrast to declining stigma, you see here um, increasing trends in uh, utilization. And that seems to suggest that stigma, reducing stigma has had um, a positive outcome in the form of um, increased utilization. But of course, we don't know for sure. Um, we can't make the causal connection. Um, we can't close the causal loop, uh, if you will. The next slide places um, mental health issues in context. So here what you're looking at um, are 
uh, diagnostic patterns across all of DOD. And I don't know if you can see the bottom part of the slide, but the years range from 2002 to 2012. And here there are two very notable things. Number one, um, there's been a rapid increase over the course um, of the conflict in diagnoses. Um, number two, mental disorders are not the number one um, diagnosis. They are number two behind musculoskeletal conditions. So um, it's very important to understand the big picture and um, to recognize that there are medical issues as well as mental health issues uh, that are going to feature prominently in um, this population of veterans going forward because each of these uh, sets of challenges has the potential for downstream consequences. A sore back now might become something different uh, down the road as the forces of aging and gravity um, take hold. Now, as we continue to try to unpack this um, phenomenon of stigma, um, if we look at the next slide, uh, we have more data about um, patterns of health seeking and care. And I'll point out that um, many of these patterns also apply um, in the civilian world. Um, so it's not to suggest that mi military folks are completely unique, but there are flavors of this that are particularly important for um, military folks. And so uh, you see in the first bullet that um, more than half of uh, service members or veterans, I'm sorry, veterans in the U.S. and Canada who have mental health problems um, don't receive care. You might notice that that doesn't say seek, it says receive. Uh, and it's a reminder that there's many a slip between cup and lip. It takes time to recognize that someone has something that might deserve um, some attention from a medical professional and then it's and then you have another drop-off when it comes time to seek an appointment, and then you have another drop-off when you actually show up at the appointment, and so on. There are many steps in the process here. You see that reflected in the second bullet. People who start treatment often don't persist. And that, of course, has negative implications for the outcome. And so it's not enough to get people in the door. They have to somehow be willing to return and complete their treatment. Um, and that has implications, as I said, for outcome. If you look at the fourth bullet, um, in theory, recovery from PTSD is as high as 80% for people who complete. But in practice, because a large percentage of people don't complete, then um, the recovery rates um, are lower. Uh, and here in the final bullet, Dr. Hogue makes the distinction between negative attitudes about care and perceived stigma from others. And so if someone um, doesn't believe the care will be effective or they don't believe the provider can relate to them or they don't believe other things about the care, um, then that's a different set of challenges from stigma and our strategies for um, addressing those concerns may have to be tailor-made to what the particular problem is. The next slide goes further uh, into this uh, reflecting efforts to create a set of measurement items that pull apart the three elements of stigma and barriers that, um, that, that we've talked about. So stigma, you see, is the first set of items. And these numbers on this slide simply indicate that these items are hanging together with each other and distinct from the other group of items. So the stigma items are about how they believe others would view them as a result of seeking care. Negative beliefs reflect their beliefs about the care itself, their own negative beliefs about care. And organizational barriers are simply the logistical things that get in the way of people seeking care. So there are three distinct elements identified that are all targets for trying to improve the likelihood that if someone recognizes that they may need assistance, that they will actually seek it. The next slide presents the results from a small study of um, Army soldiers uh, asking them about some of these um, specific things to get a sense of how common uh, each of them 
was as an additional set of evidence about how we might want to target these things. And I want to draw your attention to the things that are at the top of the list. These are listed in rank order. Um, number one is a belief that they could take care of problems on their own, which is so consistent with military culture, right? To be self-sufficient, um, to be uh, um, entrepreneurial, if you will, and trying to um, address one's own problems. But you can see how then it might make it difficult for someone to seek help. Um, then you see did not have enough time with the professional, too busy with work, and then stigma, and then a set of items related to um, negative feelings about uh, the care, worried that it wouldn't be kept confidential, didn't seem to be working, didn't feel comfortable. Although this is a very small study, it gives important hints um, as to all of the different potential points of intervention there are to try to smooth the path between uh, a service member or a veteran who has concerns about seeking mental health assistance um, and things that can be done uh, to address it. And so um, on the next slide, just to summarize um, what I've uh, presented of Dr. Hogue's work, um, a large percentage of those in need do not seek care to begin with. Um, and a relatively small percentage, or I should say a substantial minority, if that's a better way of saying it, um, receive minimally adequate care. They don't complete the course of treatment, um, and, and so they're not really reaching the threshold of what we consider uh, excellent care. Um, dropping out is common, and there are many reasons for it. Uh, and so strategies to really address that include paying a lot of attention to things like engagement, rapport between the clinician and the client um, and, and treatment uh, retention. And, and this, in fact, was one of the big motivations for the creation of Star Behavioral Health because um, we hoped that it would help prepare community-based providers to be better prepared to make connections with um, military and veteran-connected clients. Um, the next slide shows um, strategies to consider. Um, and so, uh, uh, Dr. Hogue offers strategies aimed at the organization itself, at the patient, and at clinicians. And so organizational strategies deal a lot with logistical things, trying to make sure that appointments are available, follow through on, and so on, getting mental health providers embedded within primary care so that it reduces that step uh, of the referral and the extra appointment making. Um, patient-oriented strategies to make sure that patients feel well connected to the treatment and to the clinician, um, and helping clinicians develop strategies to improve rapport and communication and, um, and, and to connect, to feel more able to connect with clients with military experience, because many clinicians, um, if they haven't served themselves, feel a, limit, a little intimidated about their ability uh, to do this and their ability to do it successful, successfully. Excuse me. Um, so I will uh, stop there. And um, if there were any parts of this presentation that you thought were brilliant, they definitely belong to Dr. Hogue. And anything that you're uh, concerned about how it was presented, um, that's up to me. And so I will um, go on and introduce our next speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Charles Engel um, to, the, um, to the webinar today. I'm very grateful for his participation. And so uh, where Dr. Hogue talked about barriers to care, um, Dr. Engel is going to talk about access to care. Um, Dr. Engel is now a senior health scientist at the Rand Corporation. Um, previously, uh, he uh, was the creator really of a um, remarkable program improving access to care for uh, service members. His research has focused on health system strategies for mitigating the chronic mental and physical health effects of war, terrorist attacks, and natural or man-made disasters. Please welcome Dr. Charles Engel. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, this is Chuck Engel here. Can You can hear me OK? I will assume so, um, unless somebody notifies me otherwise. Um, I um, 
Uh, as, uh, as Shelley said, uh, I am uh, a retired Army colonel. Um, and as I, uh, as I like to tell my kids, I'm uh, retired but not tired. Um, and I continue to uh, make efforts to uh, improve the care that service members uh, and their families are receiving um, after deployment. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our efforts to improve mental health care uh, in, in the military. Next slide, please. The, uh, uh, we'll start with some slides that tell us a little bit about access to mental health services on a national level. Um, and it, it turns out that most uh, services, uh, disappointingly perhaps, but, uh, but it is the reality, it's the world uh, as, it, as it is, that most services are actually delivered from primary care. If you look at the pie on the left uh, from this national study, uh, about 60% of those with needs uh, or disorder uh, don't get any services at all. Of the 40% that receive services, if you look at the column on the right, uh, over half of those receive their care in a primary care setting uh, exclusively. Uh, and, uh, and the remainder, uh, which turns out to be a little over 40%, uh, receive their care from a specialist. Uh, so when you sort of uh, lay it out on a big picture level, it turns out only about uh, one in five patients uh, uh, who are affected, people who are affected by uh, mental health problems, actually receive care from a specialist. Um, so there's much that we need to do besides just improving the care in a specialist office to make things better. Next slide. This slide uh, 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 refers to the same study that I just mentioned. Um, and uh, it looks uh, specifically at data related to um, those with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, of note, only about 7% receive assistance for post-traumatic stress disorder in the first year of its onset. Um, again, this is nationally. This is not just in the military. But the numbers in the military, uh, as you just heard uh, from the last presentation, are not altogether uh, inconsistent with that, that they're pretty consistent with that. Um, secondly, only about two-thirds of those with post-traumatic stress disorder um, has ever received uh, care for the condition at any time in their life. Uh, fully a third have not received any care at all. Uh, and the median time to first PTSD care among those affected turns out to be 12 years. Um, and you can see that, the, that those percentages uh, are poor compared to uh, other common um, uh, mental disorders. Next slide. So how can we do better? Um, uh, particularly in the military, uh, where we see that uh, data are uh, consistent with the national picture, um, can we increase the reach of services? That is, this large, support, this large proportion of people um, who, who aren't receiving any care at all. Um, and then once people are receiving services, I'm, I'm suddenly getting an echo, so I'd like to make sure that Everybody has their microphone on mute. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm a, okay, great. I'm going to continue on. Um, uh, okay, so uh, once, so the first step is, uh, you know, can we increase the reach? Uh, of services, that is, reach those who aren't currently receiving any services at all. Um, the second is uh, uh, for the population that is receiving care, um, but receiving it uh, from a general medical setting, uh, and to some degree it turns out uh, even from a specialty setting, can we engage those with needs uh, to address their mental health needs? Particularly in primary care, people are uh, coming in for a variety of different needs. They're not always willing to uh, engage around their mental health needs, um, or they, uh, even if they were willing, they're not always uh, aware of their mental health needs. Um, and then third, one, uh, among those receiving mental health services, uh, can we afford better continuity of care? Can we keep them in the care long enough uh, so that they can receive, uh, you know, adequate 
uh, quote unquote doses, whether that's therapy or medicine um, or both or something else um, altogether, can we get them adequate uh, uh, treatment uh, to help them to feel better? So I'm going to review our work to make uh, each of these things happen through a couple of large Army primary care um, uh, system efforts. Next slide. Uh, first, let me speak about uh, a very um, large primary care effort called Respect Mill. This is a program that involved many partners, all of them listed here. I'm not going to mention them all to try and save us a little bit of time. Um, but it took quite a bit of work engaging all these partners. We started piloting it in 2004 at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and we launched it broadly across the military health system beginning in 2007. Next slide. Um, at the clinic level, we used what's been referred to as the three-component model. Uh, the three components are, um, uh, first, a prepared primary care practice. Um, this includes continuing education for, clin for clinicians um, so that they're prepared to uh, do the right thing within the model, and the use of uh, screening tools for each visit, um, uh, and, a, uh, and validated diagnostic aids and severe, uh, symptom severity monitoring uh, assessments so that one uh, could uh, make clear sense of whether patients were getting better, staying the same, or uh, getting worse over time. Uh, the second is, uh, is a crucial piece, which is uh, this is a nurse care manager, uh, an additional resource in these clinics. Uh, uh, and the nurse care manager is used to engage the patient to address adherence to treatment uh, and severity assessment over time using these uh, measurements, uh, and to work with both the patient and the primary care provider to keep the patient in care long enough to receive good treatment, treatment that affects outcomes. And the third component is enhanced interface or contact with a specialist. Um, and here, you know, often the, um, the immediate conclusion is that uh, we just we need to put a uh, clinician, a uh, specialist, into the clinic. Uh, that may help, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Um, it's possible to put a clinician in the uh, in the setting and still not uh, make adequate use of that clinician. Uh, within the clinic, and it's possible actually to make improvements in outcome without a, without having that specialist in the clinic and doing key things uh, from afar. The nurse uh, actually meets weekly with the specialist, and treatment recommendations are given to the primary care provider um, through the nurse and through the uh, medical record. Next slide. This slide uh, um, summarizes. Uh, uh, some of the programs, some key aspects of the program. Um, Respect Mill used uh, codified manuals um, that uh, clinicians could access when questions came up. Um, it provided uh, a web-based uh, training for primary care providers and for specialists operating within the model. Um, it had specific self-help materials, both for patients and for clinicians, actually, to uh, so that clinicians could work with the patient around designing self-help strategies. Um, we had uh, uh, measures uh, using the PHQ-9 and the PTSD checklist um, for monitoring outcomes. Uh, and we used a specialized web registry that uh, allowed us not only to track patients, but to assess the quality of services that were being delivered across all the clinics that were delivering it. And ultimately, we delivered it uh, through a lot of primary care clinics. There were 97 clinics uh, at the time of my retirement, the end of 2013, that were practicing in this model. Um, and over that period of time, screening for PTSD and depression, this is at every visit, rose from almost none uh, to well over 90-some percent. And over the course of the program, over 3.5 million visits were screened. We followed about 75,000 different people in care management. And we identified on the order of about 25,000 uh, uh, patient visits involving uh, patient self-harm concerns in which we were able to bring those folks uh, to um, uh, definitive care. Next slide, please. Um, this slide really just emphasizes that the program uh, was a worldwide program, that it literally was across several contents, uh, continents, uh, several um, time zones, uh, and, and uh, gives you 
a clear sense that this was feasible to practice and, in fact, scalable, um, which is very important when you're thinking uh, on a system level. Can you ramp it up as needs increase? Can you ramp it down in times of lesser needs? Next slide. So the second um, uh, effort that I'm going to tell you about uh, was really built on the first. Um, this is uh, called STEPS UP. Uh, this is, STEPS UP is a large randomized trial. STEPS UP stands for Steps Enhancement of PTSD Services Using Primary Care. As you can see from this slide, it really takes a, a village. Um, with partners in uniform uh, and uh, partners in the civilian sector. We had uh, partners at uh, uh, the Deployment Health Clinical Center, a DOD center for improving post-deployment uh, mental health services, at Uniform Services University, at the RAND Corporation, where I am now, at the Research Triangle uh, Institute, uh, University of Washington, Boston University, and Boston VA. Um, so this was a very big effort uh, with lots of people involved uh, and we're uh, in our sixth year and the study is just uh, finished up. Um, next slide. Uh, the big difference between what we did in Respect Mill and uh, what we do within Steps Up is in this um, at the macro level. Um, we had levels of implementation. Uh, the the three-component model is really a clinic level implementation, the top bullet here. Um, and the, um, uh, in the uh, Respect Mill program, we had a site-level implementation where we had a primary care champion and a behavioral health uh, champion that would implement uh, the model. The behavioral health champion would work closely with the nurses and send recommendations back to primary care. Uh, the primary care champion would work with primary care clinicians at the site to make sure that the model was being implemented uh, well and that everybody was trained and that if primary care providers had uh, questions, they could raise them to uh, someone who did the secret primary care handshake rather than to uh, necessarily to a, a mental health uh, professional. But in Steps Up, we add this real macro level approach where we were assisting clinics that were implementing it as well as monitoring uh, their um, effectiveness in implementing the approach. Next slide. So this slide is the first of two that really summarizes um, the whole uh, uh, scale of the intervention in Steps Up. Um, uh, the, the key around this central assistance piece, um, the first bullet here is centralized components that maximize, uh, help to maximize model fidelity and scalability, as I mentioned. Um, these include uh, the, the central, uh, centralized model implementation and guidance, centralized care management op options. So we had care management options that didn't include just somebody on the ground in the clinic um, for patients that were transitioning out of the military or transitioning to other places, which is a common occurrence. Um, and there was also centralized uh, psychiatric case review uh, of all the nurse care managers using a specialized registry. So this allowed us to improve the fidelity with which the program was being implemented and having it uh, sort of implemented more, so to speak, with one voice. Um, uh, and it also added um, resources to the primary care clinics that were implementing it. Second was uh, some added care manager training. These are, uh, these are nurses, and uh, in, uh, in this new approach, we help them with some motivational interviewing training, some training in how to do behavioral activation, um, and how to do uh, basic problem solving. Um, these, these aren't necessarily complicated therapeutic techniques. Um, they're relatively simple, but they go a long ways towards uh, providing a basic uh, level of psychosocial support for patients and keeping them in care. Next slide. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the third aspect of the Steps Up intervention was that we had a step psychosocial set of treatment options. In Respect Mill, um, there was, you know, of course, the things that the primary care doctor felt comfortable doing, and then we had to refer to a specialist for other things. Within Steps Up, we added uh, uh, some interventions into the clinic, into the primary care clinic that were close at hand uh, for the uh, primary care provider. Um, some of them were actually delivered from afar through central assistance. We had a web-based nurse-assisted, self-administered 
uh, CBT, sort of a self-management strategy for the large proportion of people who really were still trying to figure out if they wanted to seek active help, but they were willing to do some things on their own. Um, we used a telephone-based cognitive behavioral therapy for people who were a little bit further along, maybe waiting to get into care somewhere, but and we wanted to initiate evidence-based treatment as soon as possible, so this telephone approach became a, a, a good avenue for a variety of folks. Um, it could also be done off hours and so on. And then the, the highest level uh, was face-to-face -face brief therapy that could be done if there was a, a specialist working in the primary care clinics, as there was at that point at many of these clinics, um, or it could be done in a specialty setting if the patient was eventually willing or wanted to receive it in that setting. Uh, and then the fourth bullet was a, um, involves an overall population emphasis. So we were trying to extend the reach of treatment beyond just um, uh, those people who were already in services. Um, and we were using uh, treatment registries to actively ensure that people who were already in uh, treatment had their treatment intensified when they weren't getting better. Uh, instead of the usual thing where people are started on treatment and then uh, uh, nobody actually goes back to assess symptoms later and see if things are improving. And also actively working very hard to bring people back into care if they had fallen out. Obviously, if they wanted us to go away, we did go away. But, um, but short of them telling us uh, you know, uh, that they didn't want uh, mental health services, we would continue to work to uh, convince them to um, continue the care that they were in. Next slide. Um, uh, this, uh, this next slide is a summary. Uh, it's a, um, a relatively complicated slide, but it's kind of a summary slide of a spectrum of different approaches uh, to, to this. Um, at the, if you look across the very top row, it starts out with usual primary care um, and ends up on the far right with steps up care. Uh, the one just to the right of usual primary care is uh, called Behavioral Optimization Program. This is, by and large, a co-location program uh, where uh, specialists are put in the clinic, but nothing else in particular is necessarily done. And then I've described Respect the Mill for you and Steps Up. So there's a spectrum of these kinds of services. Um, uh, the next slide is really just a, uh, uh, a bit of a uh, commercial. Um, this is uh, a design paper that we published describing the Steps Up uh, intervention, and people who want to know more about it can go there to, um, to read that. We are actually, just by coincidence, it turns out, uh, today submitting the, uh, the main outcome manuscript for publication. So um, hopefully you'll be hearing more about that soon, and we're very excited about the results. Um, and we think you will, too. You'll be, too. Um, I think we may be running down on time. I have a couple, uh, I have a couple other slides here where I just wanted uh, to quickly demonstrate. The next slide is an example of how this sort of central assistance can be essential. Um, we were, um, uh, this, this is from Respect Mill, uh, where when we were starting to do some of the central kinds of um, uh, assistance when we were realizing how important it was. We started monitoring suicide assessments. Uh, just this is the uh, sort of patient who comes in, uh, screens positive, and then endorses PHQ-9 item I, which is a self-harm item, whether they've experienced any self-harm thoughts over the last two weeks. And for some, when they were positive, the, um, the primary care provider would forget or not notice, and then there would be no documented suicide assessment. And we felt that this was well, it's not an outcome uh, uh, indicator per se. It's obviously a, a risk of hazardous, it's a indicator of hazardous care that we could do something about. So we set this up as, a, as a, an, uh, an important indicator we could monitor. We started monitoring it every month. Next slide. Um, and what you can see from the next slide is we had one site that goes nameless called Fort Bravo here, but it's a very high volume site within uh, the military health system. And they, uh, for a several month period um, uh, that started before we actually were uh, actively monitoring this, all, most, pretty much all the other sites were doing quite well with numbers uh, well below uh, 2% uh, of assessments 
uh, missed, this one site was missing almost half of their assessments uh, over an extended period of time. We initiated some steps that included working with providers, working with champions, working with command uh, at that site. Obviously, the, the uh, military medical command there was quite concerned about all this. And you can see that over the period of a month, that dropped to almost zero. Um, so, but it, what, it, what it really demonstrates is that um, for any program at any place, um, there can be variation in how it's implemented. And, uh, and the fact is that uh, uh, even under the best of circumstances, practices drift over time. And we have to take active steps to monitor and identify places where drift is occurring and do our best to get it back on track. Um, uh, just like the stig stigma around mental health, there shouldn't be necessarily stigma around this. There should just be a, a quick and active correction of the, of the challenge uh, at, the, at the system level um, to make sure that uh, uh, the care improves, uh, as happened in this case. So next slide, I'll uh, just summarize here very quickly. Um, yes, please, Charles. Sorry, we're getting tight on time. Okay, all right, so th this is really my, pretty much my last. Uh, to make care better, we have to be active. And simply screening or putting a specialist in the clinic, uh, while not bad in and of itself, doesn't, it's not necessarily sufficient. Um, we can do better. We can, we can provide access to quality service. We can improve outcomes. But, but to do this really requires a larger system emphasis. Um, and the very last slide, uh, um, is uh, just indicating um, my sense that um, we need to reach out uh, from on a systems level and assist practices to help them to do a better job. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And I'll ask uh, you, uh, our audience, to hold their questions until the end. And uh, we'll do our very best to preserve a little bit of time there. Um, I'd like next to introduce Dr. An Alan Daniels. He is an independent behavioral health care consultant specializing in areas of health policy, payer systems, and consumer deliver services. A retired professor of clinical psychiatry and public health sciences at the University of Cincinnati's College of Medicine, he is here to talk with us about the behavioral health workforce moving upstream from barriers to systems to the workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alan Daniel. Thank you very much, Avita. I'll see if I can steer us back on time here. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about is the need for mental health and substance use care, if we can flip to the first slide. Um, the current need is, is, is large, and if we're going to be able to meet the challenges of integrated care for physical and behavioral health, we're going to have to build a behavioral health workforce that is capable of serving these needs. Some of the needs from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 20% uh, of adults had any mental illness in the past year. Uh, almost 5% of adults report some sort of unmet need for mental health care. Uh, and 8.4% needed treatment for an illicit drug or alcohol problem. And basically what we're finding is that medical costs for treating patients with chronic medical conditions and also who have uh, comorbid mental and substance disorders is in the range of two to three to times higher than those who don't have those combined conditions. So what we need to do is build a workforce that can serve that. That's good. Keep going to the next slide. Um, there's three driving forces that really are creating kind of the perfect storm for the need for a behavioral and improved behavioral health workforce. The Mental Health Parity and Addictions and Equity Act of 2008 removed barriers to coverage. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act has expanded coverage to new people who have not had coverage before. And finally, the executive order from the president improving access to mental health services for veteran service members and military families in 2012 has expanded the, the need and the focus on the care of this population. So if we can scroll forward. A brief overview of the uh, of the conditions of the workforces we currently have, and I'm sure this can be available by slide for those on the webinar today. Um, by this year, the American Psychiatric Association predicts a shortage of about 22 child psychiatrists and close to 3,000 geriatric psychiatrists. 77% um, of the US counties have a severe shortage. Um, and there's a huge unmet need for uh, psychiatrists and prescribers. 
Minorities are largely underrepresented among the disciplines. Uh, I'm not going to go through the numbers in the sake of time. But what you can see is that we have a workforce that is not diverse. And we have a workforce that has a very high level and rate of, uh, of turnover, uh, estimated between 20 and 40 percent. And so what we have is we have an unstable workforce that's getting older, that's now distributed, and not enough to serve what we have as needs that are brewing through this perfect storm of increased coverage and opportunity for services. Next slide. Um, since we're talking about key issues of, uh, about improving care for uh, mental health services for veterans, service members, and military families, some key areas that were cited in the executive order in 2012 include suicide prevention, enhancing the partnerships between the VA and community providers, expanding VA mental health services staffing, including the training of up to 800 peer specialists, uh, improve research and development for certain areas that we know are key hotbed issues that need to be addressed, including PTSD, TBI, and other conditions. Um, and then the creation of a, a task force to begin to look at and track this. So if we go to the next slide, the Annapolis Coalition, this is an article from Health Affairs that's available if you all want to take a deeper dive and look at this. The Annapolis Coalition has been one of the largest uh, efforts to try and look at the behavioral health workforce. And basically, their framework calls for uh, areas of broadening the concept of the workforce, strengthening the workforce, and creating structures to support the workforce. And the goal being that we need to include others who are involved in, in the recipients of care uh, to engage them in their own care and engage them in expanding the role of communities to identify needs and promote wellness. Uh, in terms of strengthening the workforce, we need to build better systematic recruitment and retention strategies across all levels. Uh, training is oftentimes not as relevant as it needs to be for the world that people will practice in once they complete their training. And there's a huge issue about the role of supervisors and leaders across all sect sectors of the workforce. And finally, uh, we need to look at the way that financing systems are set up uh, that allow compensation that equals the level of training that's required. Many folks, many professionals are leaving the field because they're not able to earn a living that would be commensurate with their training and, and professional training and experience. We need a technical assistance infrastructure. Uh, we probably need a technical assistance infrastructure that also supports providers who are not well trained in issues regarding uh, military culture and the issues that oftentimes face the population we're talking about today. And finally, we need to uh, do further efforts to do research and evaluation of the behavioral health workforce. So I think that might be it, and hopefully that's gotten us back on time. So let me stop there and pass it on. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniels. Um, our final speaker is here to talk with us today about family-focused systems of care. Dr. Shirley Glenn is a licensed clinical psychologist and co-principal investigator of the UCLA Welcome Back Veterans Family Resilience Center. She collaborates on community-based programs to support reintegration and works to help VA clinicians partner more effectively with the families of veterans with psychiatric illnesses, including PTSD and comorbid substance use disorders. Please welcome Shirley M. Glenn. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking today about the importance of understanding military members in the context of their families. And I, I just want to say I was struck by how important this is. Um, over the last few days, I was actually at a conference of family court judges who were trying to understand what military, the, the impact of military service on things like divorce custody arrangements, spousal support, um, and it was really, it really brought into focus again about how military service can impact on every dimension 
of a family's lives. And, and, and it's part of the reason I'm so glad that um, I'm having the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so just thanks for putting up the second slide. Just an overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of military service, deployment, and trauma on family relationships, particularly concentrating on returning veterans. And then I'm going to talk briefly about the kinds of interventions that may help families struggling with these kinds of issues. And then talk more broadly about what are the characteristics of a strong family-focused system of care for military members and their children. And when I say military here, unless I distinguish it, I'm going to be talking about both active duty and veteran families. Next slide. OK, and, and the, the overall premise here is that when a soldier serves, a family serves. And particularly with the most recent um, uh, set of conflicts where we had people who were often deployed three, four, five times. That was years of service and loss and distance that family members at home had to absorb. Next slide. This is just a slide to point out to you that most of the, that about half the people who served in the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts were married. You can see it's a little higher with active duty. And over 40% had children. And these children were differentially young. Many were under 5 years. Most were under 11 years old. So these are um, children and families who are trying to do all the roles and things you need to do to keep a family going. Pay bills, raise children, get them to school, and all that. Often with a military member in and out of the picture. Um, and, and, and it's also important to know that a substantial portion of these were single parents. You can see here that it's 5% in active duty, 10% in reserve. So these people are particularly challenged because there's often nobody at home to really help with the family things except for if they can enlist, for example, their own parents or that sort of thing. Um, so, so it's important for us to be thinking about this issue. Next slide. Now, we know that military service can be beneficial for families. Families often um, are patriotic. They develop a sense of service, a sense of selflessness, a, self a sense of commitment to others. So there's definitely benefits. But we also know that there are challenges. First of all, deployment in and of itself can be challenging for families. And there's many studies showing there's higher rates of depression, anxiety, and health service use in spouses of individuals who are deployed. And their children often have behavioral problems as well. And then, as you can imagine, um, if the military member comes home and has PTSD, and I should also say I didn't put on here but traumatic brain injury, which often co-occurs with PTSD, um, that that can be quite stressful for the family. Um, veterans with PTSD often report more family problems. They often are struggling more with aggression, and that can be bilateral, which means both the spouse and the veteran are sort of getting into um, some physical aggression. Um, and that uh, partners and children report more difficulties when the veteran um, is home and, and living with PTSD at that point. Next slide. Now, the good news about this, if we can think of a kernel of good news, is oftentimes the main thing that prompts people to get care uh, is the sense that things are problematic in the family. Either veterans will be prompted by a spouse, you really need to get help, um, or the veteran him her, or herself will understand their issues. Um, and, and so we've certainly heard today about how, how difficult it can be for people to access treatment. But the, a prime motivator is wanting to save things in their family. 
Um, and, and, and that means a number of things. It means, first of all, that um, people seeking treatment are reporting family problems. They're often more, more interested in some sort of individual treatment or some way to involve their families in treatment because they understand that there are um, significant challenges for their family members as well. Now, we know that there's unfortunately then a disconnect between the kinds of treatments that are available because most of our treatments for TBI and PTSD are individual treatments even though veterans are suffering in a family con context. Okay, next slide. Now, I, I should point out although this field has lagged compared to individual treatment for PTSD, there are now more and more treatments both of um, specifically diagnosed PTSD as well as just, say, deployment-related stress. Um, and I just want to point you to a couple of them. For couples treatments, there's now a couple randomized controlled uh, trials that have substantiated couples treatments that might be effective for a partner and an individual dealing with PTSD. Candace Monson has one, Cognitive Behavioral Conjoint Therapy, and Fred Sauter has another, Structured Approach Therapy. These are, both man these are both manualized treatments that have been basically found to improve marital satisfaction and reduce PTSD rates in participants who come to conjoint sessions, typically around 15. There are also approaches is where you work not only with the partner, but often with the children that are involved. And some of you may know of the FOCUS program by Tricia Lester, was first tested in the Navy, has now been widely used in the military, and we've done a little bit of work with it in the VA. Um, and is also there's some exposure in, in, in the STAR Behavioral Health Program. Um, but this is where children and parents come together and develop um, strategies to talk about what the deployment was like and how um, things are going to go forward in the family. And you learn communication techniques and such. And there are strong data to show these programs really help people adapt to kind of the new normal. Next, oh, you did the next slide. Thanks. Um, now, I should say that even though we have these strong programs, um, we still have a lot of challenges in terms of building family-centered care for military members. Um, first of all, um, the Institute of Medicine report, um, and I have the reference for that at the end of the slide, points out there's a need for more systematic research on family and couple-based intervention. We have these initial starts I was just talking about. But there, we, we are still struggling a little bit about what's the best way to help families. And I, and I would say a, a, a good area of research that people are interested in now, you heard me talk briefly about um, individual treatment. And we're now having family members maybe come in and prime the pump for people to do better individual treatment. Um, we also know that families of origin who have not been involved in any of these research studies are impacted. It's very hard for, for say, the parents of somebody who's come back who's 23, 24, really struggling with reintegration issues to get any kind of services anywhere in the VA, in the DOD, even um, with our partners uh, such as Given Hour. So, so, so this is an area we really need to pay attention to. And obviously military members become civilians, they move out of the DOD, lose access often to free care and culturally competent care. And as people move into um, the community, there's more and more need for that, for people to really understand. Um, to, ask, to first ask about uh, whether someone served and then to uh, respond appropriately. Okay, next slide. I'm close to the end. Okay, so what are the characteristics of the strong family-focused system of care for military people? First of all, understanding that the individuals who come in for treatment are, first of all, members of a family system, whether or not people have military care, but really always having that in mind. You know, most of us want to be connected to others, and part of our jobs as mental health professionals are shoring up those connections. 
to routinely screen for military service. So just to be asking people who come in the door, did you have service? Did your folks? Did your child? Did your partner? So we know. Um, that we provide interventions that can involve families. So, so even, you know, in my case, if I'm going to do individual treatment with someone, I really try to meet their partners if they're willing to try to explain what the treatment's going to be like and how it's going to go and how to think about it and get the partner's view on things. Um, and to understand that families, families are a little bit like pinball machines, stress kind of boomerangs around all the different points. And so if a spouse is having trouble, a military person may feel badly. If a military person is having trouble, the spouse may feel badly. The kids absorb it all. And so really think about that mutual interplay of stressors. And then finally, really making sure mental health professionals are competent in military and veterans issues and culture. Um, there are a lot of online courses for that, as I'm sure you all know. And um, it makes a world of difference um, if we can sort of make ourselves um, knowledgeable as mental health professionals about what people have encountered. Um, as I said, I wanted to provide the um, link to the Institute of Medicine report. Um, this is really worth looking at if you are interested in how we can move forward in this field. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much, Dr. Glenn. Um, Folks, it's um, 2 o'clock, and I don't want to make you stay um, beyond the time to which you had committed. We've received one question, and what I will do is forward that question uh, to all of the speakers and encourage them to uh, respond uh, offline. Um, you have a screen, a slide up on your screen now, um, reminding you of the next webinar on uh, April 7th focused on uh, perspectives on solving veteran homelessness. I want to sincerely thank the Council on Foundations for um, partnering with us on today's webinar. And I want to thank all of you for attending and especially to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise. Good afternoon, everyone. This